So today uh, we're going to continue our PSO series and we're going to start with lecture 12. And this lecture is going to be about energy harvesting in piezoelectric materials. So we can understand that piezoelectric materials have different applications. We know they have a converse effect and a direct effect. Uh, direct effect meaning we apply a pressure and then we get charges, maybe plus minus. And the converse effect is where we apply an external electric field, let's just call this a battery with plus minus, and we get a certain deformation which then occurs after that. So this piezo would be shrinking uh, in this case. And we know that both of these effects exist, the direct effect and the converse effect both exist in piezo materials at the same time. So what are the different types of um, applications of piezoelectric materials? Obviously uh, the first one which was discovered uh, was the direct effect which a piezoelectric material is used as a sensor. So input is force and output it's charge or you can also say voltage. So this is a piezoelectric material acting as a sensor. Now for an actuator you know that uh, the input is electric field or voltage so I'll write both of them. And the output is displacement or in strain. So what are the other uh, applications of piezoelectric materials? And, and, and actually both of these can be used at the same time in devices such as medical ultrasound where we actuate uh, the piezoelectric probe with uh, uh, you know, ultrasonic frequencies and that then generates ultrasonic waves which then if there's an old baby right here uh, the waves are going to bounce back and the probe is going to pick that up and develop an image. You know, we have, little, we have the screen, we got a little baby on there. Yeah, that's what we do. Okay, so the other application of PLZ materials, which is going to be the one which we're going to be talking about in this lecture, is energy harvesting. And in this case, the input is force. The result is charge, or you can say voltage, and then we make it one step further and we convert that to store energy. So we're sort of using um, ambient vibration to charge a battery let's say, or power devices, low power devices. So charge battery, store energy, this is electrical energy. The other application is in, uh, it's sort of, actually you could consider it as an offshoot of energy harvesting and that is uh, active, what's called active damping. In this case, again, we have an input force, we have this voltage charge, but instead of storing energy, we hook up a resistor, and we know that resistors are, you know, elements in a circuit which purely dissipate energy without doing anything useful, converts electrical energy, you know, current voltage into heat. Um, and they've used this in different systems, needing a large damping coefficient, where we use these vibrations to then damp the vibration. Because energy is conserved, which is a very important concept in energy harvesting and active damping, but energy harvesting is obviously the one we're talking about today, um, it's very important to understand that uh, the energy you, you, you get or you store cannot be more than the energy you put in. So we'll be using a lot of balancing, uh, you know, energy balancing equations or power balancing equations to understand how we can get vibration and we can make it into stored energy. 
So what's basically the process uh, here of energy harvesting? And I'm going to draw a foot here. Let's say we have a, a sort of a platform. This is the platform. And underneath this platform, let's say there's like a piezo element. We're going to draw the piezo element in yellow because we know that piezos are yellowish in color. Not really. And we'll say it has some polarization direction. And then we have, like, say, a platform underneath. Okay. So this is the floor. And then we have all these, like, let's say we have a lot of tiles, you know. And let's say, I'm sure you've maybe seen something like this, and you have piezo elements under each of these tiles, and as people walk over them, energy is gathered, and therefore the energy crisis of the world is, you know, is, uh, is gone now because humans are now generating energy. Whatever. So we'll see how practical or impractical that would be. We'll, we'll understand soon enough how much energy you can actually generate from a piezo. So somebody steps on here with their foot or something like that. This is a foot in block form. Okay, maybe draw a little shoelaces for those who are more attentive to detail. Let's draw the shoelaces, someone's foot, which sort of looks like really interesting. Uh, I wanted to get this color here. So there's someone's foot right there walking on and uh, they're causing a downward force to appear on the surface and then therefore the piezo gets compressed and then charges then developed. So if the piezo is compressed here, there's a positive charge here, negative charge there. Okay, so this is the first step. The first step is you have an outside force and you transfer some of that energy to the piezo. This is trivial, but there's going to be some non-trivial parts coming up, which are very important. So in this case, not all of the energy is transferred. And we're going to understand more about uh, the rate of transferring energy, uh, different stiffnesses, uh, mechanical impedance. But all the time, all of the energy available in the ambient environment is not transferred to, to the piezo. So it's up to the designer to design the shape and maybe some energy coupling, uh, mechanical coupling uh, structures to ensure that all the energy available in the uh, environment is coupled to the piezo. This is the first step, which is often overlooked. We just understand that you put a force on a piezo and you get magic energy. So the second step, which I'm going to describe here, is once you have that force on the piezo, is that the piezo needs converts that energy from electrical energy from from mechanical energy, and that piezo itself internally converts it to electrical energy. And you're sort of limited here by material properties. So depending on your material properties, namely your electrical coupling coefficient, you'll get different voltage amounts for that uh, energy put in. So usually the uh, important parameter here is a is the piezo to G coefficient, also the D coefficient. These coefficients in the material end up uh, determining, and again the G is just the uh, D coefficient divided by the permittivity. Um, under free stress so these uh, coefficients then determine what this will be so you don't have the as much room to play around with uh, you could go for a more high performance materials or lower performance more reliable ones uh, you know PZT would be example of a uh, uh, of a lower performance but you know e cheap and easily accessible and the higher performance would be something like a single crystal piezoelectric which costs more, it's harder to buy, you can't buy any, you can't buy this at all online off of maybe a shopping cart, you know, online purchasing, but you can buy this for your lab purposes, graduate studies, whatever. Uh, but anyway, so this is, you're sort of limited by your material properties, not necessarily your design. But there's some materials which have uh, special figures of merit, which are better for energy harvesting applications. And we're going to get into those, but again, uh, this is dictated, this mechanical energy to electrical energy available in the piezo is determined by um, the, the different piezo coefficients, including the coupling coefficient. So once you have your energy in the piezo, now we're going to go to step uh, three. 
Once you have your energy in the piezo, then what? Then you need to take that energy and store it and convert it to a DC field. Oftentimes in vibrations, we're not just getting a single thump. If you get a single thump, let's let's take our oscilloscope screen. We just get okay, no no voltage, no voltage, and thump. This is gonna be hard to charge a battery. You can't charge a battery with just a thump. You're gonna to have to do usually usually in these cases you're you're gonna put this uh, let's say piezoelectric energy harvesting system on let's say car engine which is vibrating at a consistent rate. So it's vibrating. It's usually you're not gonna find it that uh, that you'll have just one thump. But anyways, even if you have a thump or if you have a uh, you know an AC force which is effectively happening, you need to find that way to get that um, you know energy electrical energy spike maybe one spike here let's try to maybe that one spike you have or you have these multiple spikes of energy which represents at some frequency how do you get that into the battery and the battery charges not with AC battery a battery will charge with DC so you have to convert that energy which is now developed that charge which has been being developed on the piezoelectric material you have to make it you have to change its behavior from an AC force uh, or you know just a single spike to a prolonged voltage so usually one way you can do this is using a rectifier so you know you have your diode then using a rectifier which um, which then you can hook up if you know this type of symbol you know you have your diodes and we'll get into the exact um, diagram but you need to create a constant voltage or semi-constant voltage to charge the battery and maybe you'll hook up your battery here this is a very simple and you also need to not only do that but there's something called impedance matching Just like in this first slide, this first step, where we have to design our piezo to match the force, to give it the most efficient uh, motion, efficient transfer of energy from the outside force, and we're going to talk more about this to the piezo uh, structure, we also have to do this electrically, and this is you know, called impedance matching, it's also called impedance matching in the mechanical case, but even here more so, you have to match the impedances or the, or the or the way which power is available and can be most efficiently transferred so you have going to have to put some type of not a compliant mechanism but you're going to have to put something equivalent in the electrical terms different circuit components to change the impedance of the energy available to that which is most easily most easily can be transferred because all the energy that you put in the piezo initially Part of it you're not going to get out. Part of it, part of the force you put in the piezo, no matter how well you design the system, you're not going to get that force transferred. You're going to lose some of that energy, or it's going to be reflected back and not absorbed in the piezo. In this case as well, uh, due to the material properties, the some of the energy will not get into the piezoelectric material. Will not be transferred. It will be simply stored as mechanical energy, which cannot be harvested. Then uh, there will be. It make electrical constraints where now you have that charge available maybe that alternating charge available on the piezo to store a battery but in this case you have to go through an electrical circuit this is a very simple diagram this is not what we're going to be using later you have to go through a very simple construct you know you have to go through construction and try to lose the most energy you know each of these are circuit components they have energy losses so to design that properly in order to generate a a waveform which can be best charge a battery, namely the DEC waveform, uh, and you have to also uh, match use a use a, not other circuit components to match the impedance to best uh, change the voltage and the you know and change the nature of the charge and energy being supplied to match the impedance of the battery. Uh, similar to how we discussed about mechanical impedance, we'll get into these are details more. So this is the first uh, lesson in energy harvesting that there's several steps uh, the first step again 
you apply the force. Usually it's going to be the, that AC force. The second step is the internal. Uh, that's the basic of the mechanical energy stored in the piezo becomes electrical energy available to and the last step is to use a circuit to charge a battery you see a charging circuit which we're going to get into soon so within going through all of these processes you could start with let's say 100 percent energy you put in through that force and you may end up with maybe 10 to 15 percent of that left over if you have a really good design 10 15 percent it's often very typical for you to get less than milliwatts of energy. You forget milliwatts of energy and energy harvesting, you're doing a great job. You have a great design. But usually they're talking about nanowatts sometimes and talking about milliwatts or less than a milliwatt or, ten, or a couple of milliwatts. It's a very small energy level you're dealing with when you're talking about energy harvesting with piezoelectric materials. So again, uh, piezoelectric materials are not suitable for all applications. They're not suitable to solve all the world's problems, although they're pretty interesting in that they can they have this direct coupling in the material itself but oftentimes if you're looking for larger power you may just want to go electromechanical you know inductive you know motor and you know use the you know electromechanical system the traditional magnetic uh, systems to harvest more energy if that's what you're interested in but if you're interested in uh, uh, harvesting energy with low weight with small size packages uh, you know, and long and perhaps and potentially longer life, less moving parts, then piezoelectric materials can may, can and may be uh, attractive. Also, for very small applications, perhaps you have want to install you know piezoelectrics to power pressure sensors on a tire. Um, and you want lower more moving parts, and you want to maybe deposit energy. Piezoelectric materials can be deposited in very thin layers. So this perhaps can be another advantage of piezos that they can be deposited, that they are, uh, that they have this coupling built in. You don't need, you know, coils and rods moving back and forth through the coils to cause electromagnetic uh, currents. Then to charge batteries, you can have this entire system in one package. So I think I spoke enough for this first introduction. Next lesson. Uh, we're going to be going over an example of energy harvesting and how much energy we can actually get out starting from again that force and we're going to try to end up charging a battery or at least do some kind of you know back of the envelope type of calculation to see what we might expect all right thank you for watching i'll see you in the next section lecture